Our lives are increasingly shaped by data, how it is defined, collected, and used. As data becomes the fabric from which we design systems, often through methods like machine learning, concerns have been raised on how values and ideologies permeate data models, who benefits from them, and how well they represent reality. Data is often taken as a given, either as an existing data set or collected through standardized practices of measuring with design decisions behind data production left and questioned by interaction designers. Each decision makes some things more visible, enabling certain possibilities for action while constraining others. But by looking at data as an object that can be designed, we risk challenging the notion that it is possible to derive observer-independent knowledge with a direct correspondence to entities in the world, an epistemological stance known as representationalism. This causes problems since data is particularly useful as a material when it can be trusted to accurately model a particular phenomenon in the world. In seeking an onto epistemological ground for proposing a designerly way of approaching data as a material, we turn to Barat. Barat's agential realism offers a potential alternative to the conundrum of whether the outside world can be reflected and mirrored, instead pointing at the contingency of all human activities, instruments and observations, and how these are implicated in defining the phenomenon of interest. Let us consider the act of measuring our own pulse using our index finger on the wrist. In this gesture, our bodies get split into two. One is a measuring apparatus, and the other is the object being measured, the throbbing of the arteries. Pulse emerges as the result of this process of mutual orientation and co-constitution. With this sensibility, making a distinction between the world and the apparatus, the subject and the object, is an active choice that Barat calls an agential cut. In measuring our own pulse, we enact an agential cut between the parts of our body that are measuring and the parts being measured, stabilizing the world in a way that allows for pulse to emerge. In the paper, we look at how agential realism can play out in design research through five case studies where designers work with the urge to pee, location data, breathing patterns, and skin conductance. Here, I will briefly cover two. In one case study, a designer engaged in an autobiographical process of data gathering of urinary habits over a period of six months, aiming to model the urge to pee and to understand whether that urge could be predicted. Initially, this phenomenon was defined through an agential cut separating the body from the context, and the data log contained only the amount of liquid and time. Gradually, over time, the designer became aware of how much coordination is spent on urination within daily life and everyday encounters with others. For example, she became aware of how she would often go to the toilet before feeling like urinating due to uncertainty about proximity to appropriate facilities in the near future, or how going to the toilet was often an excuse to take a break from work, go for a walk, or interrupt social encounters. Consequently, she had to rethink the agential cuts as the project went along, bringing bodily experiences and context more closely together, resulting in adding new notes and data around the social and material context entangled within the body, bodily function of being. Thus, the phenomena being studied, urinary habits, and the measuring apparatus, data logs, and how to read those, gradually shifted. In another case study, researchers working on inferring location from cell phone metadata built two apparatuses for producing data. One relied on paper, aimed at producing a ground truth of the researcher's self-reported stops and routes. The second apparatus relied on specifically developed applications to collect cell tower IDs with timestamps. By comparing the notes taken for ground truth, researchers became aware that, for example, a commercial sender was seen as a cut through by some who simply passed through it on their way to work, and by others, as a place where one could stay for a long time by, for example, working from a cafe. These notes were compared with the network logs, letting the researchers examine the differences and discrepancies between the two streams of data and between people. One researcher living in a remote area barely registered movement in the network logs, while another, living in a city, could register movement inside his home. 
Diffractive engagements with data about people's movement and location led to agential cuts between the lived experience of navigating and occupying different places in relation to the data produced from different apparatuses, highlighting differences between how places can be defined differently and how network data is unequally distributed between geographical locations, with both representativity and privacy implications. In all case studies, designers test different ways of orienting different sensors, people and environments to each other, both progressively changing the definition of the phenomenon being measured, while rehearsing how different agential cuts could be made to respect human differences. We call this diffraction in action, signaling a move beyond reflection, where the goal becomes to document patterns of difference, testing how different ways of becoming with the world and with sensors can produce different forms of data. How can we engage in working with data diffractively, and what might that entail in terms of design practice? As diffraction emerges in all case studies, data is lived with, engaged deeply with, explored, questioned, experienced and scrutinized through different methods, tools and technologies in different contexts entangled in everyday lives. Diffractively engaging data requires a slow, long-term process, resisting the impulse for efficiency. This can help surface, articulate and explore practices around data. Rather than prescribing a specific method for conducting this slow engagement, our case studies illustrate different design methods in allowing moments of diffraction to emerge. We show how first-person methods within SOMA design, such as autobiographical design, can foreground the designer's body and experience over time, problematized in relation to data. We also show how combining first-person with second-person person methods over time highlights differences in how different bodies and behaviors are registered differently by sensors and data sources. Third-person methods that inquire into adopting, appropriating and understanding data into the everyday lives of different users can also play a role in scaffolding new relationships with sensing technologies and data during the design process. In common, these methods can be used to articulate thick descriptions of how data is woven into practices or can be used as a material to create new ones. With regards to tools to support diffraction, we draw from the case studies to exemplify artifacts designed to make data available to be experienced in everyday life, in multiple contexts and by many people. To achieve these characteristics, these artifacts should be designed to be both concrete and open for constant adaptation, experimentation and appropriation. We hope that our work inspires others in engaging in critical diffractive design research, showing alternative ways of approaching data as a design material, attentive to how data is entangled in everyday life.